on everybody i hope everybody is still enjoying everything that we've shown you guys so far today's virtual town hall wouldn't have even been possible without our good friends at the robin hood foundation now the robin hood foundation is the largest group of property fighters in new york city so it's only right that our last conversation is with the ceo of the robin hood foundation westmore along with the world champion fencer also v files runway model miles watson Wes and and Miles, thank you for doing this for oh, us. Yes, um, thank you so much. We really have this whole project. Um, you know, I can speak for myself, and I'm sure like our team at V Files feels the same way. Um, we've learned so much about the importance of the census. You know, I never, I personally never realized how important it was, and ran away, evaded every door knocker and phone call that came in. Um, now, when I see a census worker, I'm like come on in, have a cup right. of tea, give me your yeah. forms, have, which have you done everyone? Have you called everyone upstairs? I can get them for you. Yeah. Um, and so now it's a now I understand the importance. It's a completely different thing. And so thank you to, to you and to Robin Hood for giving us not, not only the opportunity to learn about the census, but also the opportunity to share our learnings with everybody else. Yes. Um, and that's been very, very meaningful. Um, Miles, I'm going to do this introduction. Um, Wes, Miles is one of my friends, a great friend. Um, I first met Miles actually when he, uh, was a model in, I think the second B files or the third B files runway show. Yes. Miles, nice. Babe. Um, and I didn't even know that Miles was a, a fencer and on the, on the brink of becoming a world champion. Um, and oh, wow. So through, through those, you know, the years, um, I followed Miles's journey and I am, you know, in talking about the census and the third pillar of respect, I was all, I've always been inspired by the battles and that you have fought literally, you know, through your sport and off. Um, and Wes, you are my hero and champion in all things. Um, I am, you know, I want to run your campaign one day and, uh, I, salute everything that you are doing as not only as the CEO of Robin Hood, um, but as a father, um, as we, you know, we stride forth into these uncertain times. And I think one of the really interesting conversations that we had in the panel, in the town hall today was a conversation with Steve Stout. And it was really all about, you know, through the darkness, you will find the light. And I think that in these conversations that we have together, especially with, you know, two people that have, we have so much respect out there in the world, we can only benefit and learn and mobilize our community to take this personal responsibility, responsibility and accountability to make a difference for themselves. So I'm going to hand it over to you guys. I'm going to start with the legend, of course, Wes, come on. Miles, man, it's an honor to be with you, brother. It's uh, it's uh, I've been a, a, a fan and admirer for a long time, and so not only are we talking about a, uh, a professional fencer and a U.S. Olympian, a Nike ambassador, and a and a, and a model, uh, and uh, but also someone who really is a, a true activist, and uh, and and also in this time and in this moment, watching the way you just stepped up and the way you've led, and how natural it's been to you to lead has been really beautiful for our entire society to see. So to be with you in, uh, in this conversation, it means a lot, man. So blessings and thank you. Thank you so much, man. Um, and obviously it's a great honor to, to chat to you. I've heard nothing but incredible things about you. Um, you're somebody as well that, you know, I look up to you the way you've, you hold yourself and the barriers that you've broken. So it's a real honor to sit here with you. And, and um, I think now more than ever, it's such an important time to, to chat and really, you know, this next election is very important for us. I'm so grateful to be here to talk to you and and uh, and learn. And vice versa, man. And vice versa. So let me let me let me throw out a first question to you. Uh, you know, you you spend so much of your time and you're so giving of your time to to young people, to people in communities, uh, communities like the ones you grew up in, people who look up to you and admire you. Uh, what what advice do you give them, particularly in this moment, about right now? about how they should be thinking about these next steps in their life. Yeah. So that's actually a, a great question. So 
for me, obviously being born in London and then being thrown into kind of the American society, I've kind of been able to see both sides and really having this time to kind of take it to myself and seeing all, the, all of the little kids and the kind of impact that I have on them is bigger than any medal that I could ever win. So for me, it's just kind of educating the children that being educated is the most important thing that you can do now. I think the more knowledgeable you are, you know, the more you understand the law, the government, the census, everything, then I think will help you make the decision that you want. So I always tell kids, educate yourself, listen, ask questions, pay attention. And that to me is something that I'm learning as well. Learning so much more about the census, how important it is. And like, you know, Julian was saying, I never really thought it was, it was too much. And now it's so important that we literally need this more than ever. So I try to instill on the kids that educating yourself is the most important thing that we can do now. So we know the law, we know everything. So if, if times like these happen again, we're more prepared. And it's amazing. I mean, I, I love that frame that you gave because, you know, when people think about this concept of respect, right? Like, what, what, what does respect mean? In many ways, respect means for me, it means knowing your power, right? Yeah. It means knowing how powerful you are and then also being able to appreciate the power of a person in front of you. So like, if I respect someone, it means I respect their power. If I respect myself, it means I respect my own power. And so when I think about your right, where we're talking about even things like the census, people have to understand just how powerful a vehicle this is. This is a once and a generational opportunity to be heard. Yes. It's a once in a generational opportunity to be seen. It's a once in a generational opportunity to be, to be respected, to be fully, fully respected and to make sure all resources that come with that respect are actually coming, coming your way. Uh, how do you think about the, the, this moment and this movement and particularly what it was like relating for you because I mean, you know, you moved to New York and Pennsylvania at a young age. You know, how does all that reflect back on you now when you think about this moment we find ourselves in? Yeah, so that's another great question because respect is something I think for me is one of the hardest things to A, give to somebody respect because it's such a important emotion, right? So being kind of from London, I've been able to see that type of culture. And then being in America, being in New York City is such a beautiful place, but respect is something that I learned through my sport. And being able to respect, you know, something as small as my coach has opened up the doors to me to respect myself, which has ultimately been such a success for mine. And I think people take the word respect and think it's just a one-way road, but it's actually a two-way street. And I'm learning more and more about how important respect is in terms of I am as an individual and then how it is as somebody else looking at me. And I think if you respect somebody, then you can really see the progress together. And I'm learning so much more and more about that word than just from a, from a competition standpoint. Mm -hmm. And if we can't respect, for instance, our local or our state census, then how are we going to get any change at the top? And I think exactly. something so small as um, just going to jury duty, right? I would always put that off. Truly learning how important that is to make change. And I think now we're learning how important these things that we thought were such a ordeal or, or a pain to do are actually so important and steps to actually making systematic change. And that's what I'm learning. That's what I'm trying to instill on people that it's a step-by-step -step process. You can't just go right to the top. You have to respect each level. And then that's what I'm learning. And it's, I'm sure, yeah. you know what I'm saying, and it's powerful too, because I mean, I think about the fact that, you know, where, as you, you, you know, came to this country, I, mean, I come from, I come from a family of immigrants as well. You know, my whole family is, uh, at least on my mom's side, it came from either Jamaica or Cuba. And so, but one of the things we see with the census is the challenge for a lot of families, particularly, you know, particularly immigrant families or foreign born residents to understand why the census should matter to them, because it's like, cause, cause you matter. You need to be counted as well. You know, you're, you're, it's, not just about, it's not just about your number, it's about your voice. And the fact that if you look in New York, you know, there's nearly $1 billion, $1 billion at stake in census guided funding. And the majority of which will be distributed to low income neighborhoods, the neighborhoods that we live in, the neighborhoods that we fight for, the neighborhoods that, we, that, we, that we're doing all of our work in. 
places that are already receiving significant budget cuts. Faces that are already, when, when, when we're talking about what we need to cut, oftentimes it's these neighborhoods, it's our neighborhoods that are the first ones that are gonna get cut. And so the ability to keep that from happening is by making sure that we are all seen and making sure that we are all heard and making sure that we are all counted. And so I, I love what you were saying about how exactly why this matters so much and why it's important for everyone to understand why this thing matters so much. Yeah, exactly. And someone in your position, right, who has been a veteran, thank you so much for your service, someone who's CEO of Robin Hood, you've kind of seen respect on so many different levels. But I guess, do you see that one of them has helped you with where you are today? Absolutely, man. I mean, and, and honestly, I think that the, one of the main, main things that it's, it's helped me with is understanding that we can face some really hard times um, as a community, as a society, as Black people. Um, but the reality is this, is that we've seen hard times before. We've yeah. seen struggle. We've seen it throughout the history, all of our histories. We've seen what this looks like. Yeah. And the people who came before us we're still willing to fight on our behalf. So for the fact that we can be here and we can now fight another day for those who are gonna come up after us. And so I think part of the thing that I, I, I take a great deal of strength and pride, a great deal of strength and pride in my neighborhoods. You know, when I think about the fact that, that, uh, that even if you look in just New York, right? Uh, you know, when looking and looking at it through the through the lens of the census, I mean, in you look at East New York, you're talking about around 56%, you know, 65% of the residents uh, in East New York identifies black Williams Bridge, 68% uh, identifies black 25% as Latinx, Bed-Stuy 65% identifies black 17 as Latinx. I mean, this is us. Yeah, these are our people. And so part of the thing and part of the power that I think I take from not just the work at Robin Hood, not just the work that I've done as an author on these social issues, not just in the work in the military, was the fact that we know hard days are here, we've seen hard days before, and we will work through them. But the way we have to work through them is we have to go with a full consensus of making sure that we show up. Every day in every way, we show up. And that's how we're able to actually work through and, uh, and, and make a difference in, in a way that we have to right now. Yeah, that's such a good kind of point is just showing up. I think there's something that we all see the sense of urgency, at least for myself. You know, I, I'm going to be super, super honest. When I first moved here and I was able to vote, I was thinking, my vote doesn't count, mm. honestly. And A, I can't believe I felt like that. But, but B, I'm happy that now I want to instill on the kids to come, the youth, that your vote counts and it's so important that's kind of what i want these kids to know is like oh they think that you know my vote's not going to be valid or i'm just one person that's the whole point of voting <laughs> you can change the entire system so that's another thing that i want to tell these, these children and the youth are so powerful i'm young too but the, the younger kids yes you know i see how beautiful it is they're educating their parents even you know which is so beautiful that i never saw this kind of change but we must keep our foot on the gas and be a collective unit. And that's how I think we'll see real change at the top. And the beautiful thing, man, I mean, like th these folks are going to follow you. You know what I mean? Like, like they're going to see you saying, get involved and get engaged. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to get, get involved and they're going to get engaged. So for the folks who are listening to this right now, for all the young people who are listening to this right now, for all your fans who listen to this right now, uh, what, what, do what should they do? How what do we tell them about what it means to be engaged and what does it mean to actually stand up in the way that their hero and the way the Miles is telling them to to stand up and be heard and be involved? So I think that these kids they can do so many different things, right? A is being active, being out there, being at these protests, which I think actually do create change educating yourself, understanding how important the census is, doing your jury duty, and finding ways within your community to elect these people that are going to make change at the top. Because I think now I'm learning more, I don't realize that it starts at your local level, then goes to your state, then goes to the next level. And I think we think, okay, I need to make a vote, and then it's going to go right to the Democrat Party or, or presidency. That's not how it works. So education is such an important thing. Mm. And I think 
instead of you know teaching some kids at school accounting, let's teach these kids what census means. Let's teach these kids what it, how to do your taxes. I think these things are just learning processes that I'm learning now at this day and age. And I think just being vocal and don't be afraid to, to say what's on your mind and don't be afraid to put whatever the, that you feel is correct. And vote, 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 vote. I can't say that more than anything. I think that's what I've been focusing on for these children is please vote. You know, I'm from London, but I'm an American citizen. This country's given me so much that I can consider myself an American. And I was grateful for what this country's done for me, but I also want to see actual change. And I think, you know, you instill this on all your talks I've been, you know, reading and you just, how important it is. Your voice is such an important thing. And now more than ever, your voice can change the world. And I think we're seeing a sense of urgency there. I tell you what, man, I've been, I've been a fan for you, of you for a long time, man, but I'm, I could not be more of a fan after getting a chance to rap with you now. What you're doing is, it's everything. It is, it is, it is, it's not just world changing, it's life saving, man. And I just couldn't agree with you more. People need to go out there, make your voices heard. Make sure you get out there and vote. Make sure you get all your people to come out and vote. Make sure you are filling out the census. This is your time. Take 10 minutes and it will impact 10 years. 10 minutes can impact 10 years. And so I hope people go out there and truly make sure that they respect themselves, that they respect others, and that they know that the work that they will do right now will have impact over the next decade as to how people respect them back. So I'm just so thankful for you and I'm so thankful for your work always, man. Honestly, man, it goes both ways. Um, you know, what you, what you kind of instill in yourself, I take into my training because in my sport, it's predominantly white, you know, and I, like, kids getting an audience of children in there didn't see that it was possible. And all it takes is one person to create a new path. And I think kids coming up can see, oh, wow, Miles is doing something. Well, maybe I can be the next ping pong player. You know, I think I want kids to not be so set in their ways of you need to be, you need to go to Harvard, you need to be a basketball player. I think there's so many different areas that you can be valuable in and still make an impact on the world and that's i think my bigger purpose in just winning olympic medal is showing kids that there's a different path to take and if you respect yourself then there's honestly nothing you cannot do and that's why i love to tell little children and even parents that ask me these questions that respect is something i'm lucky that i learned at a young age in my sport that i take to any type of world that I'm in now, whether I'm in a business meeting, talking to somebody like you. Uh, and that's taught me how I can kind of shed my love and, and, and my wealth to, to the world. Amen. Amen. We got a lot we got to get done. We got a lot we got to get done together too. So I'm excited well, to do it. I'm thankful to do it for me. I'm, th I'm thankful for all y'all out there. Please make sure you go out and listen to what my man Miles is just saying. Make sure your voice is heard. Make sure you go out and respect yourself. Make sure you go out and respect others. 10 minutes, 10 minutes, it'll impact the next 10 years. Let's go get it. That's something that I think that 10 minutes impact the next 10 years is something so powerful yet so simple that I don't think people really understand how literally just 10 minutes of your time can change the next 10 years. Like process those words together. It's such an important thing that I think our future is in great hands with these kids, but I just think we need to really keep the pressure on them because, you know, I think they're the future. <laughs> Amen. Miles, we were talking before about like fencing being, you know, the sport is built on fighting for your family. Yes. I think that mm -hmm. like, I, like that. I think that that's a really interesting angle here um, because like, you know, I think one thing that we can talk about, like with the pandemic that we're living through, I think, you know, as we see that we've lost 200,000 people in America plus now, you know, when something like that actually affects your family, it's a different, it's a, it all of a sudden becomes a different conversation. And if you're seeing, you know, people on the news right now, basically like, you know, the story is changing because more and more everyone who is, you know, a talking head out there, suddenly we know people that have passed away or being seriously affected. Um, I would love it. Just give us a couple of sentences about like the history of fencing and, and fighting for your family and on guard, you know, what does that actually mean? Yeah. Um, 
you know, I think that because it is a, it is the sport is, is very, very old. Yeah. So quick little background. Fencing is one of the oldest sports. It's, fen it's fencing, tennis, sorry, it's fencing, wrestling, and athletics, are the oldest Olympic sports, right? So the history of the sport of fencing comes from respect and honor. So the reason why our outfits are white is because that's what blood would show up on our outfits. And you'd fight for your loved one and the respect would be there where if you drew first blood, then you would either have the loved one or have the food that you fought for. And no matter what, it was respect. Whether you hated the person, loved the person, whoever won the battle, you give them all the respect you have. So that was instilled in me in such a young age that when I'm with my coach, we salute our opponent, right? Whether you like them or not, you have to respect that they're in front of you, whether you don't like how they fence or whatever that might be. And things at a young age, I was a pain in the butt kid growing up. You couldn't tell me anything. Kid from London, I was playing football growing up and they, they go, okay, Miles, as punishment, you have to pick up fencing, tennis, or badminton. Like, first off, I don't know what any of these sports really are, but let's pick up sword fighting. And when this lady named Ellen Grayson was telling me the history behind it, I kind of picked it up and felt powerful, put the mask on, I felt like a superhero. And at this 11 years of age, I kind of turned into a kid who found his, his path through a sport that taught me respect. So that's one of the most important things that I learned at a young age that I've taken to this level now, which if it wasn't for fencing, a, I'm not sure where I'd be, but B, my respect level would be very low for myself and for people that I met. So I'm grateful, but now I have to take my platform and still respect on all these other kids that I meet, you know, whether they're younger, or older. And that's something that I'm so grateful for that has taught me one of the greatest lessons at a young age. And the sport of fencing has given me a life that I can never imagine, traveled around the world, seen all these beautiful places, and I've you know, had a lot, a lot of success in the sport, but still has that stigma of being a predominantly leader sport, you know, more so Caucasian. And my goal is to show kids that a sport shouldn't have any stigmas or any person that should look like anything. And that's my goal is to break down every barrier. So kids coming up don't have to deal with what I went through. If that makes sense. <laughs> that's beautiful. It makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. And, yeah, and and do you, and do you do you see that do you see that continuing to evolve in this moment in this time, particularly as people are, are both getting a sense of awareness um, and also just gain, getting a sense of courageousness? Yes, yes, one hundred percent. I think now seeing the messages I'm getting from kids, from parents, from even something like, for instance, if I wasn't fencing or I wouldn't be here sitting with you, um, and that's like these small little stepping stones that have kind of taught me life lessons, but. I see a lot more people that A, look like me, and B, think like me. So I think we can take away people that look like you. You close your eyes, and if you think like me, there shouldn't be any disrespect to somebody. I think that's something I think which I learned. I did a, um, I met this, uh, I mentored this kid who's blind. And the beautiful thing about the sport is you can feel the actions instead of you don't really need to see. And I think that's something he taught me just being able to feel and kind of going with the flow is something that we don't do as a society enough. We kind of just ask questions and, and, and before we even know what's going on. So I see a, a great change and I'm grateful that it's happening. I'm also grateful that I'm leading the charge, but know that there's a long way to go still. Yeah. Are there any other points that we want to, Wes, that you want to get across or, um... I think um, that we haven't covered. Let me just quick look, we're on time, I know. Um, I wanna, uh, I know, I've got one. Wes, I got a question for Wes. Me too. Ready, Wes? All set. Okay, what advice would you give to your younger self? If you were right now, uh, flip it. If you were right now, this is happening. You're 19 years old. We're, we're waiting for the the ruling to come out about Breonna Taylor. Ooh. What 
what would you do right now? Not only how do you feel like, of course, now you feel obviously you have different feelings as you get older, you know, as a father, as a husband, you know, as a ex successful executive, but what advice would you give to your younger self as a 19 year old living in the world that we are in right now today, September 24, 2020? Mm, it's a good question. You know, I, I think the advice that I would give to my younger self is know your history, because if you know your history, that if you know your history, you don't feel like you need to wait for anything to go change the world. Um, you know, because I feel like, you know, at times at 19 or at 17 or whatever, you're kind of like, well, I can do all that in a little bit. I can do that when I get this on my belt or when I get that under my belt or whatever. But, but you also need to understand not just the lineage and what you come from. Like, you know, for me, like, I wish I would have fully, fully comprehend that, you know, that I come from the lineage of Paul Robeson. And I come from the lineage of Stokely Carmichael, and I come from the lineage of, uh, you know, of W.E.B. Du Bois, and I come from the lineage of Langston Hughes, and I come from the lineage of James Baldwin. Like, I don't have to wait for anything. They've already set that path, and they've already set that pace. And so the thing that I wish I would have told myself or understood at that point was, what are you waiting for? Uh, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like, like the stage has already been set. Yep. The path has already been laid. And so now the biggest thing for you to do is just step into your greatness. It's to step into that place that's already been laid out for you. And that's the thing I really wish, uh, you know, if I, if I was talking to folks in that stage right now, say, when you know your history, there's nothing about the future that should scare you. Wow. That's, I have one question for you. Um, what would you say the greatest lesson you've ever learned from a failure? Mm. I got this, this seven-year-old kid asked me this question. <laughs> what was your answer, Tom? Um, my answer to him was, well, what I asked again, uh, what's the good lesson from failure? Oh, um, what's my answer again? Oh, I had a really good answer. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my answer was from failure. Oh. I remember I'm saying that I've, I remember coming around and saying that I've learned more from failure than I ever won, learned from a, from a win. Yeah. But for me, it was, oh, wow, those are, those are great questions kid asked me. I can't remember my, my answer exactly. Well, I'll I, I tell, I, I tell, tell you what I think my answer is. And uh, um, I think the greatest lesson that I ever learned from failure, and I would probably say this for any failure, is that I'm still standing here. Yeah. It's the fact that failure doesn't stop you. You know what I'm saying? Like failure is something that you do, you experience, you move on, you fail again, you get up, you move on, and you keep going. Like failure is not something, failure is not a beginning and an end. Failure is something that will consistently be your companion. And the reality is if you're not failing at anything, it means you're not trying anything. Exactly. I, I don't want to live a life where I never fail because if I live a life that I never fail, it means I'm living a life I'm not doing anything. So, I mean, like, listen, you're going to fail and you're going to get up the next morning and you're going to keep pushing. So, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a great question because, I, yeah, but I guess my answer would be um, the lesson I learned from failure is that it's always going to be there and I'm going to keep on seeing it all throughout my life. And that's all right. My goal is to make sure that I have more successes and failures, but it's always going to be there. That's a great answer right there. That's a great answer. And I think look, people are just so scared of the word failure, right? And it's like, what's all right? Try again. And I think that's like a thing is people, and that's the great thing about sports is we fail every day. And, but we can find a positive out of failure. And I think that's something that little kids, I'm like, failing is great. Just don't let that define you, you know? That's, that's what I tell kids is don't be scared to fail. Like what's, it's not, you're still alive. And I think that's something in which I would tell a young kid is fail as much as you can. And you'll learn more in the, than you ever learn from a win. So, right. I like yeah. that. Everybody, anybody who is scared to fail, you're not prepared to win. I mean, if that's not, if that's, if that's not a new tattoo, I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Wow. That's, and I have one more question, which is kind of a, being someone who did 
So for a country, how do you feel about people kneeling for the anthem? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that people who kneel for the anthem, they're expressing their First Amendment right. Yeah. I mean, the idea of, 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 of peacefully expressing how you feel about an issue is something that I fought and defended, right? The very first, the very first amendment in the Constitution is a freedom of speech. The very first thing, right? That was the thing that the, that the founding fathers of this country found to be so important that it was the first thing that they put in the Constitution. And so for people to challenge it uh, and to get upset about it means you're fundamentally getting upset about the cornerstone on which the country was built. Literally the cornerstone yeah. on, that the country was built on. And, and, and the reality is, is that for people who are peacefully protesting, for people who are peacefully kneeling, but by, by getting upset for the fact that they are peacefully demonstrating a frustration on something, it also means that you have yet to find the space in your mind or your heart to be able to even understand what they're protesting in the first place. To understand the fact that when we're talking about this, this, this incredible lineage that we, that we continue to see, the fact that we continue to see names that continue to be, that continue to be starting off as hashtags because people are forgetting that they are human beings in the first place. So whether you're talking about George Floyd or Michael Brown or Philando Castile or Freddie Gray or Anthony Anderson or Chris Brown or Tyrone West or Walter Scott or Sean Bell or Eric Gardner or Sandra Bland or Breonna Taylor or Laquan McDonald or Tamir Rice or Ahmaud Arbery or Trayvon Martin. Like these are people these are people who lost their lives after having basic interaction with law enforcement with people that are protecting to serve them. And so for anyone who A, is, is combating the reality that people are just exercising their First Amendment right, or for people who are not finding the space to be able to hear the argument, to understand why this rallying cry matters to not just us, but should matter to our entire society, then I, 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 ch I challenge the commitment to American values that they tend to drink themselves with. I mean, I don't think I've ever had a better answer than that in my life. Because <laughs> you, you, the way you say it is from both perspectives, you as human being, as a father, as, and then you as someone who's served for this country. And I think people don't see that side of, of the, um, flag per se, you know, and I, I've obviously dedicated my life to win medals for this country. And if I'm not happy to hear the anthem, the anthem used to mean so much to me. You know, when I first moved here, it was like, wow, I won for this country. It felt incredible. And then now kneeling is something that I don't want to have to kneel for the country that gave my family an opportunity, but I also don't know another way to peacefully bring awareness to people that look like me that have just died for no reason, no reason. So. And I'm also somebody who's, I'm white and black. And growing up in London, you're taught to say you're mixed race. So when I came to America, I was like, no, you're black, you're African American. I was like, understandably, technically, I'm not African or American. My dad's Jamaican, you know? So I understand, and I'm learning about the culture of people where you're put in this box. And I love both sides of who I am, you know? But, but you know, my, my grandmother went to prison for dating a white man. I learned about this last year. Mm -hmm. So, and this is my mom's mom. So I'm learning and educating myself about just what you said. The history goes way, way higher than just my mom, my grandmother. It goes higher at Tubman, past that, you know, without her, it, there would be no me. So I think nothing is better than education. I'll say one thing is, I think there's no better education than traveling the world and experiencing culture and seeing people for who they are as opposed to what you see on, on the TV. And that's been my biggest thing is traveling around the world, meeting people, talking to people. We have a lot more similarities than you think than just yes. color of the skin. Like you say, values. And that's something we need to get back to is we're all just human beings and we all believe the same. Just, just being hateful is just so much more effort, you know? And just, Hopefully we can get some real change in this world, but 
I'm seeing some beautiful things come out of this and I hope they really do stick and, um, and make, this, make this country what it's meant to be. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So, Amen. but. I'm, I'm proud of you, brother. Thanks, guys. I, I really am. Thanks, man, you too. And, and, and I hope that one day we can, you know, catch up and, and uh, see each other in person soon. <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. And also, and also uh, I want to make sure that you get my, um, my cell information and all oh. my contacts. So we'll make sure we stay close, man. And anything Thank you man. need, let me know. And Thank Julian is the best. Pleasure, man. Hey, Wes, thank you so much, guys. Yeah. Thanks.